Okay, welcome to chapter 13. Uh, we're going to be talking about prisons and jails today, uh, or this evening or this morning, whichever it works out for you during the day. Um, if you recall way back when we started these lectures, um, we'd introduced the concepts of uh, ethnocentrism and chronocentrism, that is the idea that your society, your environment is what's normal, and your time is what's normal. One of the things when we're talking about prisons and jails, and I'm, I'm making an assumption, is that most of you have never spent any significant length of time in prison and jails. So again, your perspective um, is different, is gained um, from different areas, from fiction, from reading, maybe from contact with the prison. So hopefully this chapter will um, allow you to maybe broaden your perspective to uh, maybe understand that there's a little bit beyond uh, initially what you, you think or what you currently think you know. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, we've got some questions to ask. And some of this relates to what I was just talking about. Is there is um, a popular image of what prison and jail is like? So we can go back a few years and we can look at that kind of classic movie, The Shawshank Redemption, or more recent TV shows like Orange is the New Black. Um, and we can say, okay, this is, since most people will never themselves experience prison, this is where they begin to form their ideas of what prison is like. And how do you think um, the media's portrayal of, of media and fiction and, and TV have, the media's portrayal of prison has shaped how you think about it. Second question, um, in, in just a strict economic sense, um, and then expanding that to um, uh, other areas, are prisons worth the cost of what we pay for them? Uh, are they worth the cost of what they do to our society? Are they worth the cost of what they, they financially um, require as an expenditure? Do prisons create or prevent crime? Um, so ask yourself, are prisons accomplishing the goals we want them to accomplish? Uh, lowering recidivism rate, for example. And then, of course, what can we learn from other countries? Again, stepping outside of that ethnocentric, and sometimes I think other centuries as well, chronocentric idea. Okay, so let's, let's go back and examine the history of prisons a little bit. Um, and, and this is, I guess, one of those areas where chronocentrism comes into play. Uh, actually using prisons as the basis of punishment um, was rare historically. If you go back uh, a thousand years or two thousand years or three thousand years and you say, how were most people punished? Were most people punished by incarceration? The answer is going to be no. Now, it certainly did exist. There certainly were, were societies that locked people up. Uh, there were certain groups of people that were locked up in preference to other punishments. But physical punishment was far more common, uh, what we call corporal punishment. Also, capital punishment was more common and used more often. So we killed people uh, and we hurt people. Uh, we also did a few other things that we don't do much anymore. Exile was a fairly common punishment for certain crimes, pushing people out of the community. Now, early American prisons and early American jails, which I think is a more precise way to talk about this, are very or were very similar to what existed in England. And this shouldn't be a surprise because uh, we're colonized from England, so obviously we're going to bring a lot of our institutions with us. Now, today, um, prisons are very different. Uh, if you go back to the 1700s, the early 1800s, um, one of the things that surprises most people when they start the, the study of penology, which is the, the study of punishment in prisons, is that prisoners were required to pay for their upkeep. Um, Another thing, uh, although this is something I, I would argue has been revived, is that prisoners were very commonly held for debt. One of the uh, major reasons people were incarcerated is they owed money they couldn't pay. Now, we have, at least in some areas, decriminalized that today. You can still go to jail for owing debt. If you can't pay a fine, you can wind up in jail. Um, but it's not as common. 
men, women, and children were housed together. Now we're used to gender segregated prisons. We're used to prisons that are segregated by age. So we have juvenile facilities, we have female facilities, we have male facilities. Um, but again, hundreds of years ago as the, the modern jail is just starting to develop, um, we didn't have that separation. Um, the, the genders were mixed and sometimes there were indeed children inside prisons. Okay, so the first real jail slash prison we can talk about is the Walnut Street Jail and this is in Philadelphia. Uh, this prison was really constructed um, in the late 1700s in the United States and it had its roots in Quakerism or the, the Society of Friends as they're sometimes called. Um, Quakers were a dissenting Protestant sect uh, that still exists in America today. Uh, there's large numbers of them actually. And they did not believe in corporal punishment. They did not believe in hurting people. So when they had to, because Pencil, the, the Quakers became a, a very powerful faction inside Pennsylvania, when they were setting up the, the colony in the state of Pennsylvania, they did not want uh, to repeat what they saw as the folly of corporal punishment. They didn't want to beat people, they didn't want to whip people, they didn't want to brand them. So they looked for an alternative. Um, and uh, again, since this, this um, change of opinion was really being um, created or fostered or promoted by their religion, they looked to their religion for, okay, well, what should we do? And two things that really struck uh, them, first of all, was prayer that individuals in prison should try to develop a closer relationship with God, the Christian God here, through prayer, and work, that work intrinsically made people better. It made them appreciate it. It improved character. So these Walnut, the Walnut Street Jail, uh, first of all, they, they physically isolated the prisoners. Um, prisoners didn't come in contact with anybody else. They were supposed to meditate or pray reflect upon their sin. Um, this initial experiment was a bit of a disaster. First of all, what they found was that by having everybody in solitaire, where there was no communication between prisoners or between prisoners and their loved ones, began to uh, manifest itself in high levels of mental instability. Human beings, we know, are uh, social creatures. They require social interaction to uh, r remain normal, basically remain within the, the boundaries of acceptable behavior. When you isolate them, it can exacerbate both pre-existing and create mental problems. The other problem with the Walnut Street Jail, which was probably fatal to its, its continuing operation, was it was very expensive to operate. Um, so if you said, well, everybody's going to be isolated, nobody's going to be together, well, all those communal rooms went away. Uh, multiple people in a cell went away. Um, communal dining went away. So you, you, you started having to feed people, house people, treat people very individualistically, and that's going to be more expensive than doing it as a group. Um, that's a picture of the Walnut Street Jail. Uh, you can see it. It's in 1774 in Philadelphia. So like I said, this actually predates the American Revolution. If I'm not mistaken, uh, this building is still there, or parts of this building are still there. And I think it's been converted uh, into a bit of a museum and a tourist attraction. As I understand it, you can actually spend the night inside the Walnut Street Jail. Well, developing out of this... Um, was a more robust system, but it expanded beyond a little bit, um, developed from the Walnut Street Jail. We call this the Pennsylvania system. Now many of the systems we're going to talk about take their name from the state or sometimes the city or county uh, within which the first or the model of this is created. So the Pennsylvania, the Walnut Street Jail, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so we call it the Pennsylvania system. Again, silence, solitary confinement, uh, work. So they did um, work in the cells. Now sometimes this was what I guess you would call meaningless work. So there was, uh, at least around this time, um, they would give them boxes which had wheels and you had to turn the wheels so many times. That was deemed to be work. Um, a, a later iteration of that, of course, was to give them physical things to do. And this begins to resemble much what went on in England in the workhouses where 
uh, not just prisoners but poor people would be confined and they would be given uh, very menial tasks. Sometimes it was things like picking apart ropes to uh, keep the jute inside of it. J-U-T-E. Um, gradually the um, Pennsylvania system, the solitary confinement system, was changed a little bit. And the first state really, because now we're getting into the United States, we're a little bit later, uh, is uh, was in Auburn in New York. And so we call this the New York system. And here we allowed the inmates to live and work together, although we we kept them more, uh, we kept silence uh, as an alternative. But there was still this interaction. Uh, there was obedience to rules. You were segregated by offense. That was really the first thing. So we started saying, okay, murderers here, uh, burglars here, debtors here. And this is also at least partially the origin of the old idea of stripes, the black and white stripes for inmates. And there's a lot of different iterations of that. I mean, it's, it's orange and white, or it's orange today. But this is the beginning of it. That's the Auburn system. Um, and you can see here's Auburn prison, and this begins to look like a modern prison. You can see how you've got these wings coming off of a central spoke. You've got these individual cells, although often we're going to put people um, uh, multiple people in prison and it begins to really look more like what we kind of think of as a prison. Around about this time we begin to see a real split internally in America between the North, Walnut Street Jail, Auburn system, Pennsylvania, New York system, and the South. Gradually they begin to develop different systems. Now the South was very opposed to the modern penitentiary movement. Um, so particularly by the middle part of the 1800s and after the American Civil War, um, the South and the people running the South had lost the slave labor. And many of them sought out a substitute for this. So they began to use the justice system as a mechanism to, in many ways, recreate or substitute for slavery. So. If you were arrested in the South, it was very common, um, particularly if you were black, that you could be leased out. So you're, you're convicted of a crime, which you may or may not have committed, frankly. And they say, well, you know, Farmer Jones up there needs to get his crops in. So we're going to lease you to Farmer Jones. He's going to pay the county, and you're going to pick his cotton. And you can see how you don't have a choice in this you're being compelled. It looks a lot like slavery. Remember that the 13th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which abolishes slavery, um, allows it to remain as a punishment for crime. Um, around about the 1870s, um, a reform movement starts to develop in the United States. So you have the Pennsylvania system, the early part of the 18th, late 17, early 18s. You have the Auburn system, early 18s to mid 1800s. Now around about 1870, again now this is in Elmira, New York, because New York was uh, the most populous state by this point and really was leading in a lot of ways. So Zebulon Brockway in Elmira um, decides to change it. One of the first things he does is he introduces something that we're familiar with today. He segregates by age. So younger prisoners are removed from the general population in hopes, of course, that they're easier to reform. They begin to institutionalize individual treatment, individual rewards and punishment for good behavior and allowing parole. Uh, this is something that starts both in America and in England. And we have the beginning of the parole system. And uh, so we, we stopped calling them necessarily penitentiaries, started calling them reformatories. Uh, that's a picture there of Zebulon Black, Brockway. Doesn't he look like he's a lot of fun? And those are, um, I'm not sure if those are inmates or prison guards, because one of the things that starts to go on here is that if you visited some of these um, prisons, uh, the Elmira prisons, they'd look quasi-military. So there were, the inmates were dressed often in uniforms. They had bands. Sometimes they published newspapers. They had formations. They marched. So it was somewhat military in its structure. Uh, the reformatory movement was um, was not terribly successful, and around about the little bit after, I'd say the the First World War in the United States, the medical model of how to treat tr crime becomes um, 
kind of the new and emerging thought. This is based on the idea that crime is an illness. Now, it's not an illness in the same sense it's a biological illness, although there might be biological roots here or, or genetic roots here, but that it is an illness that strikes society. So you treat it like you would an illness, you treat it in a medical model. So it focuses on things like, you know, what are the underlying conditions that made people sick? What are the underlying conditions that made people criminal? So we look at sociological issues, psychological issues, physical issues. We look at genetics and biology. And this was opposed by people who, um, and again, America is very much embracing the rational model of, uh, rational choice model of, of uh, crime. So it was opposed by people that said, well, there, this isn't an illness. People are choosing to do this. Um, you know, you don't choose to get diphtheria. Um, and so we, we, you, but you do choose to rob a bank. And the, the counter argument there is um, you may, okay, um, have a pre existing condition that makes it easier for you to contract diphtheria. So it, it, it is more of a mix. The medical model doesn't reject free will, it says there's other things that go into it. So the medical model kind of was in vogue um, from starting really in the 1920s and 30s it gathers strength uh, after the second world war i think it becomes very very important but by the 1960s and 70s people are very discouraged because we're we're seeing high crime rates we're seeing uh, the inability of prisons to fix this if it's possible and in 1974 robert martinson writes an article probably one of the most impart, important articles in penology called what works and what he says essentially, although there's a bit of a retreat from this in some later works, is that none of these reforms, this medical model, nothing's really worked. We've been studying this problem for going on 200 years, you know, 1974, 1774 is Walnut Street Jail, it's 200 years and nothing works. So what we need to do is simply go back to the older methods. Now, in, in fact, remember, let's keep Cronus perspective here, you're going back to something that is 200 years old, but isn't 500 years old, isn't that old. It's really something that was invented in the 1700s. And so let's go back to making prisons harsher, let's make sentences longer, let's make prisoners uncomfortable, let's make them suffer psychologically and physically. Um, so we we could talk about how um, we had a custodial system up through the 30s where you incapacitate, you deter, uh, and then you had this attempt to rehabilitate, which really runs from about 1950s to 1970s, um, and then we have a punishment model. Now, recently, reintegration has become a big issue, preparing the inmate to rejoin society, remembering that even if you give someone five or ten years for a heinous crime, they're still getting out at the end. They're still going to be back in the society. And the question is, you know, how do we treat them? So let's look at who goes to prison here. Um, the, the one on the left there of your screen is your state prison inmates. And you'll notice there that the vast majority, about 50%, are there for violent crimes. And then the second largest category is property crimes, but a significant percentage is there for drug crimes, uh, 16%, and the other public order crimes, which typically are not crimes of violence. Um, so that's about 27% if you took those together. Still, inmates in state prisons tend to have a more violent history. Now federally, let's look over on the right side of that. You'll notice that more than 50% of the people in federal prison are there for drug offenses. 36 for public order crimes, only 7 for violent. So federal prisons don't tend to have a lot of violent criminals as a percentage. Now, you have to take this with a bit grain of salt because some of the people in there for drug crimes, some of them for public order crimes, they might have been convicted of those, but, uh, you know, violence was associated with it. So who goes to prison by race? So let's look at the general population. Now these, these statistics are about 10 years old. These are the Brooklyn statistics. We're going to get the 2020 statistics in more detail and moving forward, but let's just use these for now because it's a good comparison chart. 
the breakdown of the population in the United States is roughly 64% white, 12% black, 16% uh, Hispanic Latino, Asian 4%, other 3%. And a lot of this, of course, is self-identification, and then you've got issues of mixed race. But putting those aside, if we compare it to the prison population, uh, let's compare whites to blacks. Whites constitute 38% of the prison population, but they're 64% of the general population. And again, roughly, that means that you are only half as likely to go to jail if you are white than you should if it reflected the same statistical probability. Now let's flip that and look at blacks. Blacks are 12 percent of the population and in our chart over here they're 38 percent of the prison population. So you're three times more likely if you're black to go to jail than if you're white. Now remember whites only have half the probability of going to jail so comparing those two you're six times more likely to be in jail if you're black than if you're white. Um, Latinos and uh, Hispanics, again, how you want to categorize those, somewhat up in the air there, um, their rates are higher in prison. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not an insignificant, it's about a 30% increase over what the general population should be. Uh, Asians are actually underrepresented in prison. Uh, and others are um, underrepresented in prison. I'm not exactly sure how we deal with those numbers because we tend to, when we discuss race in the United States, we tend to look at the big three groupings as we understand them, white, black, and Latino. All right, prison organization and management. All prison administrations have a simple mission at its heart. Keep them in, that is keep them confined, keep them safe, keep them in line, keep them healthy, keep them busy. And prison administrations tend to be a hierarchy. Now when I use the term hierarchy I'm really referring to a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid you're going to have the warden, sometimes called the superintendent, and he is in charge. He's, he's responsible for the organization and the, and the performance of the facility. Underneath him he's going to have his support staff. Further down, you're going to have the custodial employees that deal with the inmates. These are going to be, if we use the old term, the guards, as opposed to corrections officers. Um, now, it's not always clear what everybody does in this hierarchy. It's not always clear how everybody functions. So this is an um, organizational chart for a typical correctional facility. You, know, you notice the wardens at the top. We would tend to think, okay, you know, the custody group, which is probably the largest group here. Um, that's what prisons are all about. They set up the security, the guard forces, the training, the safety, prisoner discipline, investigation, visiting schedules. Great, that seems to be everything it does. Now, think about though this second category. Who's in charge of the buzzer? Who, in, who does in county? Who does purchasing, warehousing, commissary, food service, clothing, laundry? And then flipping over to uh, programs like treatment, medical, mental, recreation, classification, volunteers, religious service, and then the fourth one, work and farm programs. So you can see that a prison is more than just locking people up. It's a total institution with a lot of moving parts. All right, so quick information on our prison here in, in Raleigh, and this is just something fairly recent. Um, there are about a thousand inmates in central prison in Raleigh and there are 707 full-time employees that work there. The stated cost uh, is it costs about $62.64 per day or approximately $22,000 per year. This is direct cost to keep an inmate in. It doesn't include things like what's it going to cost to build the the building, what's it going to cost to renovate the building when it runs out, in other words depreciation, all sorts of things. Um, there are, and there's going to be variations between those. Some inmates might be more expensive, some might be less. Are there any offsets? But 22,000 is a relatively no, low number for incarceration. And that number I would not be at all surprised to see go up uh, in the near future. About 380 cells, there is death row. There's also a mental health center that's got 144 beds. So if you go on a tour of central prison, 
um, you'll see essentially almost a mini hospital and a, mental, a mini mental health center because uh, mental health issues are so so concentrated in prisons okay there's when you, when you ask you know what's the best way to run a prison well there's no best way um, but there are a few things you have to keep in mind are you keeping order that is are the prisoners behaving um, and then how do you make them behave so there, there's the carrot and the stick you can give them amenities you can give them small things like access to a cantina or radio or maybe being able to watch certain TV programs and these are your carrots to make life livable and then of course you have the stick don't behave you can go to solitary confinement or something like that um, also what services are available uh, you have people that come into prison that had limited opportunities in life maybe we're going to get them their GED maybe they, we're going to give them a skill they can use when they get out of prison besides committing more crimes so um, we classify prisoners in the modern world at, at least on three primary criteria, and I'm going to put aside gender because I'm a little bit separate there. What's the serious? What's the nature of the crime? Is it serious or minor? So the more serious, the more likely you are in a maximum or a super maximum prison. How dangerous are you in the future? You might have someone that 50 or 60 years ago committed a violent crime, but he got a life sentence. He's 70. He's 80. Is he really dangerous? Is there a need for treatment and rehabilitation? Is someone in there for a short period of time, 30, 60, 90 days? Does a rehabilitation make sense? Uh, or maybe it is critically important. Maybe you know we're dealing with someone who has a drug issue and we need to fix that before we should let them out. Different facilities have different means of separating and classifying them. And there are typically four levels. Uh, minimum, which is exactly what it sounds like, the least restrictive medium, maximum, and supermax. So let's talk about the supermax. Um, North Carolina tends to just use our maximum security. States like California, for example, have supermax. If you went out to Pelican Bay in California, that's a supermax. Supermax, in theory, houses the worst of the worst. Very controlled environment. It operates almost in a perpetual state of lockdown. Um, inmates um, basically live fairly isolated lights. In, in, in many ways a supermax really starts to resemble those old Pennsylvania uh, systems in many ways. Very isolated. Maximum security still very locked down, uh, still get dangerous felons, lots of um, security and surveillance, militaristic structure in the sense that um, guards wear uniforms, you've got ranks, um, it's, it's very structured. Um, often to the point of, you know, counts and things like that. Um, the next level, which is about 45% of all prisoners, this is where most prisoners or a plurality of prisoners wind up. Medium security prisons, less restrictive, more contact between inmates, uh, more educational programs, more treatment programs. If you took the medium and the minimum for example, you'll, you'll see less women in the max and the super max. You'll see more women in medium and minimum security prisons than one of the gender. Also, younger prisoners tend to be down towards the minimum as well. So we can classify this differently. And then you could do racial studies, which I invite you to do. It it's, it's, would be an interesting exercise for you. So a little less restrictive there. Now, the minimum are very low risk securities. Very often there's no guards, no armed guards at minimum security. Inmates have more freedom. Rehabilitation is more common. Um, you're still in prison. You're still restricted. But very often there is daily work passes or things like that. So it can, it can be for about a fifth of the people who go to prison, not as strict as you might think. All right, in the 1980s, um, we decided that we were going to lock our way out of the crime crisis and we begin to lock up more and more people really the prison population explodes and currently if in 2019 there are 2.3 million people either in jail in prison in juvenile facilities or immigration detention and there's about 55,000 in North Carolina um, which puts us squarely in the middle, although that 55,000 may not include uh, immigration and a few others. 
the um, reasons for this increase well one of the things we did is more crimes were created new crimes were created and more were punished by jail and prison sentences got longer it was entirely possible back in the 60s and 70s that you might get a sentence of three or four years that today would get you one of 10. Uh, more federal prisons, the abolition of parole in many places, that keeps more people in. Immigrants going to prison, um, so we began to really lock up a lot of immigrants and more women in prison. So this is the rather frightening chart I will show you about the prison population. You can see that um, we kind of chug along in the 50s and it goes up a little bit in the 60s but we have you know a population increase and then it, it goes down a little bit in the late 60s and then really starting about 1976 1980 it starts to skyrocket such that by the time we get to um, 2010 2012 uh, we just have a massive prison population now remember this is just prison it's going to kind of include jail and juvenile facilities so um, it, it just puts the United States head and shoulders above everybody else. So North Carolina's increase, let's take a look at that. Um, we have, uh, now again, that's, this is why that 55,000 is a little different. Uh, you'll notice that if you include federal prisons, people in North Carolina who are in federal prison, our numbers go up to about 66,000. So we have 36,000 in our state prisons. We have 19 or 20,000 in our jails and we have uh, 11,000 federal and then we have some involuntary commitments and some youth um, facilities we're not counting um, a few things in there that you know could uh, increase those numbers um, if we look at it as a per 100,000 so in other words don't look at it in raw numbers because North Carolina's population goes up look at it in if we hold to the percentage of the population in jail, you'll notice that um, our jail incarceration rate goes to from about 50 to almost 200. So there's a huge increase there. And our prison population goes from about 200 per 100,000 up to 350. So there's a big increase, not as big an increase actually as our jail populations. So why did it grow? Well, um, your likelihood that you're going to get arrested for drugs and weapons and other crimes would be actual prison time. Your sentences got longer. Your prosecutions filed more charges. The legislature created sentencing enhancements, mandatory sentencing, and ended parole. All this caused an increase. Now this is very expensive. You know, if you're trying to increase, keep thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So let's just say, I know North Carolina had 55,000 there. So um, let's just say 50,000. All right, 50,000 at 22,000. I know that's the maximum, but let's just go with that number. 55,000 times $22,000 a year. All right, so that's um, 50, $550 million. That's a lot of money. Okay, so you, you really have to understand that at a half a billion dollars, that the criminal justice system is really expensive for states. So states are looking at ways to reduce this. So one of the things they'd like to do is let's not put as many nonviolent offenders. So remember that chart I showed you a while back where I said there weren't as many drug offenders in North Carolina prisons. That's um, something that's been a direction we're moving in. If you went back 10 or 15 years, you'd see a lot more drug offenders in North Carolina prisons. So we wanted to start pushing the nonviolent out. Um, we wanted to release some of them. We wanted to decrease recidivism rates, uh, decrease the rates of probation and parole violations. So many states, including North Carolina, have adopted these um, in hopes of lowering their prison population. There's a lot of negatives of putting someone in prison. First of all, focusing outside of the inmate, because remember, famously, no man is an island. If you put someone in prison, it's likely that that's going to impact their family. So high rates of incarceration lead to, in family units and other units, higher rates of sexually transmitted diseases and pregnancies. It also means that in the United States today, about 3 million minors, 2.7, have one or more parent in prison. 
Now think about how many families are led by single parents. That's going to mean that if you put a single parent in prison, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people, of children, uh, minors, who you're going to need to care for somehow. This additional expense. I think this is also, uh, this is an aside, but I think this is one of the reasons that you see lower rates of incarceration for women, the chivalry effect, is do you want to lock a mother up? I think there's less hesitancy to lock fathers up. Of course, there are physical and mental problems associated with prisons. If you look at uh, prison illness, if you look at hepatitis rates, if you look at HIV rates, they're much higher in prison and there's a higher probability of contracting them. If you look at addiction, unemployment, and homelessness as related to people who were inmates, again, or will be inmates, is higher. And again, we have disproportionate impacts on minority groups. One of the alternatives that's been explored is let's, let's go to private prisons. They're going to be cheaper. So these are run by corporations uh, for profit. So currently, there's about 130 private prisons in the United States today, housing about 140,000 inmates. Now, theoretically, we're hoping they're cheaper because they can be run at $63 a day. Now you notice I told you that even a maximum security prison in North Carolina is $62 a day. So you can see that they're not that much cheaper. They actually may be more expensive, although interestingly enough the labor costs are lower. Now I think you have to take into account that uh, if, if you're running a state facility and you are a state corrections officer, you're going to get paid a, a livable wage, most probably. Often you're in a union if you're not in, in North Carolina, and that makes sure you're going to get paid a livable wage, but you're certainly going to get health care that's uh, adequate or more than adequate. Uh, private prisons are not. So you're going to have a lot more part-time uh, corrections officers or guards, and then the, the private prisons have to make a profit. They have to return money for their investment. A state prison does not. So there's not a lot of evidence to show that private prisons are significantly cheaper. In fact, there's some to show they're more expensive. There might be less red tape. Of course, the alternative here is this can lead to increases in violence and abuse. Um, there, there's also this paradox I'll mention here. If you're running a private prison and you have two prisoners that you could house, one that acts up and is unruly and is dangerous, and one that's very good, he behaves, he doesn't do anything. Which one do you want in your private prison? Well, I think the answer, obviously, is you want the good inmate. Um, and you want to keep him as opposed to the more violent one. You actually want to get the more violent one out of your prison. You don't want to handle him. So what can happen with private prisons is there can be this kind of perverse desire to keep people in prison who aren't necessarily dangerous and at least push to public prisons or sometimes push out of the system completely people that might be dangerous and hence more expensive. So uh, private prisons themselves do tend to see more violence. I think that's because they're not as nice as public prisons. They tend to be close to public inspection and review because these are private facilities. Um, and physically or philosophically people are seen as commodities bought and sold for profit because again these private prisons will sometimes have businesses operating inside them. Alright, let's shift from jails to prison and I know, and I'm as guilty as this as everybody else, that people use the term jail and prison interchangeably. They actually do have different definitions. A jail um, typically holds people who've committed very minor crimes or are awaiting trial. Um, now, if you look overall at the number of people that go through the facilities in a given year, more people will go through jails than prisons, but the sentences, the time they spend in them, are shorter. So you still have 875,000 inmates in a jail on any given day. But jail funding is a low priority for government. This leads to overcrowding and very dismal conditions you do not see a lot of rehabilitation in jails. You do not see a lot of programs in jails. You do see a lot of overcrowding in jails. So prisons are operated by the states and the federal government. Jails typically, North Carolina, they're going to be operated by the county. Some states, cities will operate them. 
Um, Jails typically hold people from the local community, local residents. Prisons, you're separated. You can come from anywhere. If you're in central prison, you could have come from Asheville. You could have come from Wilmington. If you're in a Wake County jail, you're probably from Wake County. Prisons hold people who are convicted. Jails have some people who are convicted of minor offenses, misdemeanors, but they also got people who are just awaiting a trial. Prisons have rehabilitation education. Jails usually only have food, basic clothing, basic safety. Who's in jail? Well, uh, jail inmates' populations are overwhelmingly young adult males. And jail inmates are more likely to be convicted of nonviolent crimes. So, yes, if you look at the North Carolina jail prison population, there's not many drug offenders. You look at our jail population, there are a lot. You also have a lot of pretrial detainees, people arrested who can't post bail, people who are just waiting because they, they're they innocent until proven guilty, uh, people who've been denied it because they are subject to poor conditions. They, they There's no place for them to go. Um, typical jail sentences for misdemeanors, 30, 60, 90 days. And very often there is a credit, so you might get a 30-day sentence, but you might only serve 21. Jails can also hold people who are in custody, but not in the formal system. So you might have someone that shows up that has a mental issue, and you might have a temporary commit committal to a jail. Additionally, immigration violators, probation parole violators, people detained for their own safety for very brief periods of time can wind up in jail. And these are this category of others that you might see in jail. So who runs the jails? There are about 3,300 jails in the United States. Most are managed at the county level. So in North Carolina, again, the sheriff of the county within which the jail is located, so Wake County, Durham, Orange, big counties, uh, Mecklenburg, Charlotte's big county, but take a small county like Northampton or Mitchell, the sheriff runs the jail. Um, there are problems because, remember, a lot of the people arrested have mental illness problems. Well, these jails don't have the facilities for them. They can have health problems. Again, jails don't have facilities. So sometimes you'll see people transferred from jails to prisons because the prisons have the medical facilities to handle them. You can have people with substance abuse and dependency issues. People that are addicted to different drugs, narcotics, alcohol, and have to go through detoxification, jail is a poor place to do that. You can get very, very ill during withdrawal from drugs to the point of death. Um, jails are overcrowded. Jails are stressful, so there's a lot of aggressive behavior. And most likely the larger metropolitan jails have more problems than some of the rural jails, at least different ones, I would argue. Um, sheriffs can make money off of jails. In Louisiana, um, a sheriff gets $24 per day per inmate to spend on him and half of the wages earned by the inmate on the outside. And he spends that money how he wants. Now Alabama is even worse. Alabama says we're going to give you money to feed people in jail. And if you don't use it all, you, the sheriff, you can keep the money. One sheriff in Alabama actually kept $750,000 that he didn't spend on inmates that he managed to keep. Um, also, one of the things is you can make money off of inmates. Private phone companies bid for and get contracts, uh, and it can cost you up to $25 to make a phone call from prison. And this money is split, or a lot of it is charged back, and given to the sheriff um, in order that he can spend the money. So there's a lot of discretionary money that flows through prisons and jails. The uh, future of jails. Of course, we're, we're kind of moving to uh, new jails, the new podular jails, more direct supervision, more inmate and jailer interaction, uh, and more treatment. So there is, at least in some of these jails, an attempt to address these problems. This is one of those third generation jails. And you can see how it's different than your kind of standard jail that you might, might think of in the direct supervision. Okay. On that note, about 45 minutes, about where I like it. Uh, whenever you're ready, we, you can move on to the next chapter.